everybody. <laughs> we are <laughs> from Chicago. We are here representing Loyola University Chicago. Very excited to be here with you all. Um, this is my first presentation since before the pandemic, like out and about. I know I had a baby and then lockdown and <sighs> It's nice to be back up here holding a microphone. Um, I'm gonna let Megna introduce herself. Hello everybody, it's wonderful to be here. Um, my name is Meghna Chandra, um, just Dr. Meghna, someone downstairs said, you should say it. And anyways, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in economic justice at the Institute of Racial Justice, uh, which I think really fits um, the theme of this conference, the way the two things are just absolutely intimately connected. Uh, and I um, actually wrote my dissertation on university-driven gentrification. So seeing what's happened in San Francisco is really uh, just very relevant. And this is not the model that we want for communities and for the poor and for uh, African-American communities in particular. But we're going to talk a little bit about the work we've been doing. Uh, Dr. Twyla will introduce it. All right, everybody. So I am Twyla Blackman Larnell, born and raised in the Chicagoland area. All my higher education is um, from the Chicagoland area, and I'm an associate professor of political science at Loyola. And my research focuses on cities. I do a lot as it relates to cities, government, representation, but a big part of my work focuses on race and class in a wide variety of areas um, that relates to economic development. Now, the Dean of the Institute of Racial Justice, Dr. Malik Hanfield, cannot be here today, but some of y'all may know him. He was in San Francisco doing work for a very long time. And we are so happy that he was able to get the Institute of Racial Justice up and running at Loyola. Um, we are very, very excited about, about the, the program. But I'm gonna dive right on in. Okay, I know you all are coming in. We will try to keep um, pretty straightforward, you know, as scholars and professors, we could get really caught up in technical terms and statistics, and we're going to try not to do that. But I will tell you that everything that we're going to talk about here today has already been discussed to some extent or another. So I was getting really excited as I was waiting patiently <laughs> to get up here and, and point to everything that has been said this morning. And so hopefully, um, hopefully you all can make the connections with us as well. Okay, so first... We are missing slide. I'm so sorry. I think in all of that setup, we opened up the wrong presentation. Or no. Something funky happened. That's okay. We'll, we'll figure this out. We'll make this work, okay? It's just like in class. All right, so let me first give you some background on the Institute of Racial Justice, and this relates a lot to um, what Mr. Mike Blake was talking about in relation to public-private partnerships, right? And when those uh, RFPs come out, there's all this competition from different organizations for monies to be able to support issues that we're all interested in. We have the exact same interests, so to speak, but we're competing. What we're here today is to represent the institutional racial justice that focuses specifically on public-private partnerships that involve higher education institutions. Why higher education institutions? Because we have access to a substantial amount of resources that most nonprofit organizations, community organizations, and other community members just don't have access to. Software, data, statistical analysis, and things of that nature. So just a really brief overview of the Institute of Racial Justice. We are an interdisciplinary hub for racial justice work across Loyola University and beyond. We build deep relationships, accelerate transformational research, education, and create a collective impact toward racial justice and equity. So the emphasis is on community-engaged research. Um, I don't know how many scholars are in here today, but oftentimes people get caught up on doing research that's going to publish and not so much doing the research that matters to our communities because for a really long time that just wasn't valued. Now it is, especially since there's so many more RFPs out there, but that's a, a whole other conversation. But for us, the Institute and other organizations, higher education institutions, play a really big role in providing communities with research and information that they may need to further pro progress in their different um, 
goals. So what we're going to be presenting today is actually based on a partnership with the Chicago Urban League. It was one of the Institute's first official community partners. And every year, the Chicago Urban League puts out a report uh, based on the state of Black Chicago. This is a really detailed report that focuses on the conditions of Black folks all across Chicago. And previously, it did focus primarily on, on folks who identify as non-Hispanic Black. But as mentioned earlier, we have to broaden our understanding of what it means to be Black. And in Chicago, it's very different depending on what neighborhood you're in. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. So the project that we're working on today is, is kind of big, actually. It's massive. Okay? It starts off with this emphasis on open data. Open data is generally referred to as the process by which cities, nonprofits, higher education institutions are making their data available to the public. This helps from a governmental perspective and transparency. You and I get to go and analyze the extent to which school children have access to internet. We took a go out and be able to determine where asthma rates are higher than others. And that's all coming from the city of Chicago, right? And you can see here, sorry, it's not in the middle. These are all the different data sets that we pull from in this project. Okay, so we have the city of Chicago, Chicago police, Chicago public schools. We also collected data from the EPA. We collected data from the Housing Association around mortgage rates and approvals, uh, what else, the Census, Financial Protection Bureau, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is kind of a big deal because all of this data comes in very different formats, which leads us to the next point about big data. How do we compile all of these different data sets that are collected for different units of, an, of level of analysis? So this is like if it's individual level, neighborhood level, census tract level, et cetera. How do we make all this data talk to each other? And that was the purpose of this project, so that we can get all these different data sets to talk to each other so that we can analyze them to a level that they have not really been analyzed before. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic. And Megna, who is like our, our mapping genius, <laughs> by the way, OK? Um, she'll explain how we went about the work. Sure. OK. I'm going to oh, shut up. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, yes. So as Dr. Twyla mentioned, we used a very powerful software called ArcGIS to do this mapping. And so I want to just start um, before Dr. Twyla really lays out the theory uh, and the practice behind all of it. I just wanted to get into some of the technical to kind of demystify all of this because it's not that it's not rocket science. Um, and I think it is something that can be done and understood um, and processed by many different people and many different communities. So first of all, I just want to talk about why we go to the block group level. And I think this goes to what Dr. Twyla was saying about things not being a monolith, um, that there is a kind of story that you can tell. Um, but the more detailed information you have, the more you can really get at what's actually going on. So the census collects data at different levels. Um, one is a census tract level, um, and the other is another is the census block group. So a block group is um, a cluster of blocks, usually 200 to 550 housing units, um, and it's the smallest uh, geographical unit. And so you can really see the pros just by looking at this map. This is just a very simple map of concentration of black people in Chicago. So on, on the left is uh, neighborhood areas. So you can see like you're kind of getting a picture, but not exactly. Um, middle is census tract, but then you really see with the census block group, you can actually see what's going on. Um, this area is Hyde Park. Um, so you can actually see some of the more fine grained processes like gentrification um, and things that you wouldn't be able to see if you didn't have this kind of fine-grained understanding. Um, of course, the cons are you have more missing data, but you know you work with what you got. So just really simple. Um, the first kind of map you can make with the data that's available is just a very simple spatial join. Um, so it's the data as it's available is usually at county level. So you have to clip it to Chicago boundaries using GIS. Um, and then using uh, GIS, you can start to really make your own patterns and interpretations. Um, this here is a map of, uh, I think, percent BA, percent of population over 25 with BA. 
And you can really play around with the colors to tell a story, um, especially about inequality on the north side versus the west side and the south side. Um, so it's, it's a very powerful tool and not actually that difficult to do. Um, a lot of the data that you can, like Dr. Twilo was saying about open data, uh, it's already at the block group level. So you can take it to the next step of actually representing and showing what's going on. Um, so the next kind of data mapping I wanted to talk about is point data. And this is data like this data set is of uh, crime in Chicago. And it says exactly where and when each incident happened along with other information. But obviously when you map it, there's just way too much to make sense of it. And I think this is one of the things about open data is that it can be really overwhelming. And it's just like, how does the average person know what's actually going on? So you can do what's called a spatial join where you aggregate the, the total number of crimes per block group. So you can really see where uh, violent crimes are happening across the city. And Dr. Twyla is gonna talk about some of our findings a little bit more after this, but just right off the bat, you can see that contrary to stereotypes, the violent crimes are not happening in uh, black areas. And the, this is the west side and this is the south side. Violent crimes are actually happening downtown. <laughs> so it's just, I mean, just seeing the data actually playing out completely uh, just demolishes a lot of stereotypes and just says what the story actually is for the people on the ground. Um, the last kind of uh, data that I just wanted to talk about is searches and queries. So this is also where you get point data about different things that you can then map onto other indicators. So this is a data set for the Chicago public school system, and it has data on you know, school performance, attendance, uh, truancy, college enrollment, things like that. So what you can do is select for the schools, uh, like this is showing high schools with college enrollment of under 30%, and you can map it uh, onto percentage black population. And um, Dr. Twyla will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so just again, uh, we're, this is gonna be what our presentation is about, but you can really use these correlations and patterns to tell stories. Um, you know, going from that big open data to mapping it uh, is very powerful. This map on the left, very simple map, again, of just concentration black versus concentration white. Um, and you can see they're basically the opposite of each other, uh, which just speaks to the history of segregation uh, and discrimination in the city of Chicago. Uh, you can also see the level of segregation faced by the black community in particular. Um, Dr. Twile and I did uh, index of dissimilarity analysis. I think the number was like 80%, 80 percent of all black people would have to move to different block groups for uh, the black population to be spread out among the city. So, um, you know, we're going to talk more about this, that where, where there's high percentages of asthma, um, you really see the way that place comes into uh, some of these indicators that you don't get just by talking on the individual level. And this last map, I just wanted to talk because people were talking about not having a deficit um, understanding of things. This is a map of all the schools in the city that have either strong or very strong family involvement um, mapped onto concentration black. And you can really see that, you know, it's not that parents are not involved in schools uh, all over the city, they are involved. And there are other problems that are happening um, but you cannot blame parents or families. And so I just wanted to end with um, the other thing we were able to do because we are drawing from a lot of different data sets using GIS is join, uh, join all this data together, put it all together, uh, demographic, housing, health, income, crime. We have over 180 variables. So like when we say big data, we mean big data all at the block group level and we can start, we haven't really fully started yet, but we want to really running correlations, regressions, trying to understand what is the relationship between, you know, crime and vacancy and underutilized schools uh, and what is actually going on at the community level. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Twyla. Thank you, everybody. And again, I apologize. I have no clue how our slides got out of order. No. 
Just give me one second. We'll find it. There it is. Well, maybe not. That's okay. We'll, we'll just jump right into it. All right, so about 10 years ago, there's a professor, Dr. Robert Sampson at the University of Chicago, and he writes this book, The Great American City. And I tell everybody about this book, Magna knows I've told her about it a billion times. It's all about Chicago, but specifically he explains the role of race and space. This is why maps are so important. We don't see maps being used to the extent that they should be used because as Mag Magna said, it shows stories in a very different way than we're used to it can make things very very clear so give me a few moments just to give you a quick lecture on why where you live matters okay most of us know that but some people fail to forget that the first thing that samson tells us is that cities are not flat they are quite uneven they are very unequal neighborhoods are a consequence and a cause right they're the outcome and the producer what does that mean where you live has an impact on your life, right? And that in turn impacts where you continue to live, right? It's like the circle of life in terms of neighborhoods, et cetera. And so where you live becomes a symbol of various um, measures of opportunity and success. This could be social economic indicators, culture, the strength of your local economy, crime and health, okay? So we have to think about space a little bit more. What is space? First and foremost, space is socially produced, just like race. It is created by man. And it's created by man, specifically the powerful, the wealthy, the white man, to be able to reproduce power and social hierarchies among space. This is why these maps are so important. Because in Chicago, particularly, not so much here in San Francisco, in Chicago, these patterns are very, very obvious. And I'm going to show you in just a bit. But what ends up happening, depending on where you live, has a direct impact on your life experiences, okay? But on the flip side, it also adds value or takes value away from these spaces. And this is largely in relation to racial capitalism, which we'll talk about again in a moment. Okay, so the creation of spaces is a two-step process. First and foremost, you have these biased systems, these governmental institutions, these policies, et cetera, that push and pull people into different spaces based on race and then class. It's very important to acknowledge that. Race is the number one factor that goes into the creation of space and then class. So what does this mean? In Chicago, for somebody like me, I, I take the train all the day in and out. Don't believe everything you hear about CTA, okay? But you can come through the west side on Kesey, which is an overwhelmingly black community, also overwhelmingly low income community, but there are still people like me getting on the train who are going to their professional jobs, who own their homes, et cetera. They become the backbone of these spaces because we wanna live in the communities in which we grew up in. That doesn't necessarily mean though that those spaces reflect our socioeconomic status, right? So the second part of this process is when we make our choices. Right? So you have this racist system that's pushing and pulling people into certain spaces, and then we, based on the amenities we want and what we can afford, identify which spaces are most, pro are most uh, preferable for us. So this is not a chicken and egg problem. I have to explain this to people all the time. Having concentrated poverty is not a chicken and egg problem. It's by design. It's by design. Okay. Chicago is one of my favorite cities. It's probably why I'll never leave it. Okay. In the last year, Chicago has been ranked the second best city in the world. It's also been rated the best big city in the U.S. We are known for so many things, but all of these things come back to the diversity that's in Chicago, which is so ironic because Chicago is also one of the most racially segregated cities in the United States of America. Here is just a quick pie chart of the racial demographics of the city. I won't spend too much time here. We know there are three major groups in the city, white, black, Latino. In the last 20 years, we've watched the proportion of black folks in Chicago decline and the proportion of Latinos in Chicago increase. This is really important to remember when we start talking about accessing resources. Okay. What we have in Chicago is a tale of two cities. Robert Sampson makes this very, very clear. 
in a fundamental sense, he says, individual selection is both a neighborhood effect and embedded in a process of structural sorting. So if you look at these maps, what you see is over time, the city of Chicago has been really, really good at implementing processes that support the creation of predominantly white neighborhoods in the wealthiest areas of the city of Chicago. Now, I know not everybody knows Chicago, I think, I think everybody should. <laughs> right? City of Chicago, you can see that black folks are overwhelmingly populated in the south and far south, right? As Magna Menchie got high park up here, we're coming further south, Alsip, et cetera. Then you have the west side over here. We're talking North Lawndale, Austin, et cetera, for those who don't know. And then up at the top is Rogers Park. That's where Loyola University is situated. Over here, we have the concentration of white. And you will see that white folks are predominantly located in this little midsection here and all across the north of Chicago. This is really, really important because as we move further, and I'm gonna show you these maps first. What you see is that economic resources are concentrated in white spaces. So this here is a map of per capita income. I wanna be very clear, Chicagoans are not known for their wealth. Okay, and there's a wide space in the city where people are not making more than 50 or 75,000 a year. However, in the predominantly black spaces, we see that income is exceptionally low. Okay, exceptionally low. What does this mean? It affects everything else. It affects everything else. So this table is breaking down statistics around income and wealth, and black folks are in the second column. What you'll notice is that black folks rank last on every social economic indicator, except having a bachelor's degree or higher where they rank third. Now this is pretty interesting because it perfectly reflects what many scholars refer to as a racial hierarchy, right? Where dominant white society gets to pick and choose the racial groups that they prefer the most, and therefore those groups have access to resources and opportunity that relate to that racial hierarchy. So next you have Asian folk, then Latino, and Black folks right at the bottom. Now when we use GIS, we used it more as a data management tool. This allowed us to put a lot of variables on top so that we can see not just where black folks live, but what are the conditions in those black communities. And as you can see, right, the last shows that resources and opportunities are being hoarded in predominantly white spaces, whereas this advantage is being concentrated in black spaces. So here we have a map of the poverty level, and we have a map here of unemployment. You can see again, unemployment is highest in black communities on the south side and the west side. Now it is important to note though, again, not all of the predominantly white spaces in the city of Chicago are living the life, okay? But they're not being affected by poverty to the same extent as black folks and then also Latinos in the city as well. So housing. I always get, like my lectures on racial capitalism really get me amped up. I am not a preacher, but I do get kind of excited when I, especially if you give me a microphone, okay. But here we notice that rentals all across the city are high. It's pretty much the same here in San Francisco, right? The cost of housing in Chicago all across the city has been increasing. But it's kind of bizarre to know that those families that are spending the most of their income on housing are in black communities, right? This is not valuable housing. They're not valuable luxury apartments, but they're spending more than 50% of their income on housing that we know for certain is lesser value, not being maintained. And there's definitely not like granite countertops and ceramic tile, okay? So why are they being so burdened with their rent? What is the problem with this? What happens is that over time, racial capitalism, again, right, valuing neighborhoods based on the racial composition of those spaces, leads to property in predominantly black spaces being consistently undervalued. So not only are black folks hit twice when, when it comes to property value, because your property is gonna be valued lesser as you being a black homeowner, but it's also gonna be valued even lesser if you're in a predominantly black space, okay? This perpetuates a decreased rate of return on investments. 
there was a lovely woman in the first panel that talked about having to move out of state to be able to afford a home. This is the same thing that we're seeing play out in Chicago with many middle class and higher earning black Chicagoans leaving the city. And we'll talk about that momentarily. But by decreasing the rate of return, it's not as profitable for black homeowners to own homes, especially in the communities that they grew up in. So what does that mean? They don't go back to those places. And so those neighborhoods that are in need of middle class and higher earning black families to help support the economies in these spaces, the schools in their spaces, it's just not economically feasible for them to go back, okay? This continues to perpetuate divestment because the rate of return on investment in these spaces is not as high. So it's very difficult to even get gas stations in some of these neighborhoods. If you've ever been to Chicago, people will tell you like there's only a few places where you can go get gas outside of downtown in the loop. On the north side, there's way more gas stations, not so much on the south and west side. It's a big reason why people on the south side go to Indiana for gas, also because taxes are cheaper. All right. So as a result, investors are not funneling capital into these neighborhoods. So it's kind of like uh, this book Robert Sharkey calls it stuck in place. He makes the argument that black children born in poverty are way more likely to have children that live in even more poverty. Because while your neighborhood is experiencing divestment now, the effects of divestment are going to be 10 times worse by the time your children grow. Right, so when we're talking about reparations and we're talking about solutions, and this was mentioned earlier about cash infusion in the spaces, a big part of that has to relate to housing and making investments worth your while and worth your time. And also making those investments accessible to the people from those neighborhoods. That's another really big thing. Gentrification is huge across Chicago, okay? Which leads to the next slide. This is looking at median housing values over time. You have 2000 here, 2010, 2020. As you can see, the value of housing in predominantly white spaces in the loop is growing and growing, and it's coming further out. For any of you all have been to um, Chicago, right in here is like the UIC area, okay? If you know UIC, for a really long time, it was surrounded by the project. Hope Six came, we demolished all the project buildings in Chicago, and actually, Median housing value has increased substantially where those public housing units were located. You have the infamous Cabrini Green up here surrounding UIC, but not so much the south and west side project areas. Why? Because they're further away from the most valuable pieces of land. Okay, so what ends up happening is as values of housing increase, the Black folks that are living around the downtown are being push into spaces that are actually much, much smaller because there's not as much affordable housing. I want to show you this last um, slide about housing because it was mentioned earlier. Vacancy rates in predominantly Black spaces are also super high. This is problematic for a lot of reasons. Safety is a big one, but it also makes these neighborhoods ripe for gentrification, okay? In the city of Chicago, we are seeing a ton of developers that are coming into these spaces and buying up these vacant homes for pennies on the dollars, flipping them, and then selling them as luxury housing. And they're, they're selling. So housing prices are going up, but very, very slowly. These areas aren't gentrifying nearly as fast as the areas around the downtown, but it is happening, which means then that low-income and affordable housing is even less accessible for Black folks in Chicago. Loan approval rating, I'm gonna, Magna is amazing, okay? Um, housing data, especially when it comes to housing value, is very, very hard to collect. And it was also pretty hard for her to be able to get all this together into a map. But what you can see here is actually pretty um, unnerving. It, it, it makes me angry. <clears throat> Loan approval rates by census tract. We see here that it's much, much easier for people to be able to get a mortgage loan approved in wider spaces. Okay, we ran more tests and we know for a fact that loan approval rates for black folks are almost 10% less than white folks in the city of Chicago. So not only do we have all these vacant spaces where black folks could be investing in their communities, they could be buying homes, they could be buying apartment buildings, they could be opening up stores, they're not getting approved for those mortgages. Right, so it makes it really, really hard for us to invest in our own spaces. And this is just showing you owner-occupied units as well. 
Now let's move on to health, because all of this stuff is related. I think these slides are the most um, disheartening. As you can see here in the city of Chicago, life expectancy rates for black folks have always been much, much lower than any other group and has declined even more during and after COVID. Now, what a lot of people fail to acknowledge is this. This first map is from the EPA and it is based on the pollution burden score. So this is how much pollution is in your neighborhood and in the surrounding neighborhoods. And as you can see, Pollution is a problem for the whole city. I tell people this all the time. Mask is probably in our best interest, okay? However, Black folks seem to be the only people that are suffering exceptionally from those health illnesses that are related to pollution. Why? Access to resources to be able to deal with the effects of pollution, right? If you're a lower income family, you may not be as able to buy that very nice HEPA L filter, right? Or be like us and have your Brita filter or buy a ton of bottled water. What ends up happening is we see a massive amount of asthma in adults, okay? This translates to higher rates of COPD, both of which we know can be fatal, especially as adults, even asthma, especially if you don't have access to healthcare. Food deserts is another big problem for the city of Chicago. And if you've been following uh, the literature on food deserts, the city of Chicago has become a not so great example for how to deal with it. A food desert is any urban area that is more than one mile from a supermarket, okay? This is kind of bizarre because Chicago is a pretty dense community. So one mile in here is like the size of the tip of my finger in the map. Okay, what you see is that there are grocery stores all over the Chicago, but there's very few grocery stores per person in predominantly black spaces. Now, Lori Lightfoot and Rahm Emanuel, the recurrent mayor, previous mayor, they did attempt to subsidize pretty big grocery stores to locate in these spaces. Whole Foods got a really big subsidy, and so did all these. There was another target. Even after receiving these subsidies, Whole Foods and Target, both of them backed out of their contracts within three years, right? Why? Because these stores weren't profitable, and we're talking down to here. The stores weren't profitable, but it's Whole Foods. Like, did you really expect to be super profitable in a low-income food desert? No way. That's what the government subsidy was for. But what do we realize? Even when you subsidize, it's not always enough. Which gets back to what Mr. Mike Blake, I want to make sure I get his name right, since he said it so many times, I got to remember. Um, this is why we have to rely on ourselves. This is why we have to rely on nonprofit organizations and pulling our resources, not just data, but funding, financing, politicians, to be able to create grocery stores that are owned by families in the neighborhood. Believe it or not, um, Middle Eastern and Arab uh, communities in the city of Chicago have invested a substantial amount in black spaces when it comes to grocery stores, gas stations, and things of that nature, which is fine, but it's just not black folks in those neighborhoods that are owning those organizations, and therefore the question of commitment to community is not the same. I'm going to go try to go really fast here, okay? These maps show that Chicago is losing Black folks at a very, very fast rate. Some people will argue that this is also by design because they are overwhelmingly used and losing uh, low-income Black folks in Chicago, largely because there's no access to subsidized and affordable housing, right? So many people are moving to the suburbs or other states where there is more access to Section 8 housing. But the effect is huge for schools. Under Rahm Emanuel, we had a pretty controversial policy where 50 Chicago public schools were closed. This is huge. All of these purple dots that you see, this is what we refer to as underutilized schools. That means that these schools have less than 70% of the students that they're supposed to have. Some of these schools are operating at a capacity level of 25%. That means They've lost so many people in their communities in the last 10 years that they're operating at very, very low levels. They are more than likely going to be closed in the next 10 years. There's still a moratorium on school closures right now, but that ends in three years, right? What does this mean? All is put together, okay? It means that we have to pay attention to neighborhoods because what we see happening, um, is that there are a ton of communities that are super vulnerable and 
again, black folks are not monolithic. There are middle class and high income black folks in these spaces, but they can't carry these communities on their own. Right. And for many of them, they're living in these spaces at an economic loss. Because, again, remember, we talked about the rate of your investment in these spaces as well. So some of them are this is what we call like social responsible investing, not being so focused on the financial return of your investment, but the social, the social and the community return on your investment. So what are we trying to get at here with big data? as a tool for effective policies and programs, it help us to better identify who needs support, okay? Which of these neighborhoods need support and specifically what type of support they need? I always explain to my students the difference between equality and equity, right? Equality focuses on input. Let's give everybody the same thing and it should all work out. It does not work out, right? Equity is acknowledging that different groups or different neighborhoods need a different level of resources or different policies because all these issues are interrelated, right? Income is directly tied to housing. Housing is directly tied to schools, which we didn't talk about here today. Schools is directly related, related to crime, which we also didn't get here today. And all of this is affected by health, which we know, which we know is being instigated by government policies. Um, are any of you all familiar with sacrifice zones? Sacrifice zones are these really interesting uh, spaces that cities refer to where they will uh, concentrate industry activity manufacturing, highways, things of that nature. But what happens is they're also overwhelmingly located near black spaces and low income black spaces. So it's not a surprise that black folks are living in higher rates of pollution or that they're being affected at a higher rate by this pollution. I wanted to go back to this slide because it was mentioned earlier. We did not want to talk about schools. We didn't want to take up too much of your time, but um, Mr. Blake brought up internet access. This is a map of kids uh, with internet access during COVID. And as you can see, right, the more purple is the less internet that's available. And as you notice, those kids on the West and South side, these predominantly black spaces, even in the Latino spaces around them, they did not have access to the internet when COVID started. Right. So whereas the news said that the story was that teachers were not ready for COVID, the school was not ready for COVID, there's no, even if they had computers immediately, what were they going to do if they don't have access to internet? So now the question we have to ask ourselves is the extent to which Chicago public school students um, were negatively affected, particularly in their learning, because they couldn't keep up during COVID. Right. We were on lockdown and I was teaching, my husband was teaching, the kid was in high school, and that little one, the three-year-old, was streaming. That requires pretty good internet, okay? <laughs> so if you have multiple kids that are trying to go to school all day e-learning with no internet, this is a huge impact. This slows things down. And then if we go back to uh, Robert Sharkey's idea about being stuck in place, then our expectations in terms of academic achievement and performance for these students can't be any higher than what we had before we're actually expecting less. Um, and very little data was collected about student performance during COVID. I have my own reasonings behind that. Um, so we weren't able to really kind of dig in to individual level involvement. Um, we actually have time for questions. I won't dig into too much more. Any thoughts, ideas? Yes, please, sir. Yes, yes, sir, you? Yes, sir. I'll walk over there. I'm Twyla. Yes, sir. <laughs> and you know, we, we always talk about gentrification, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we get gentrified. Um, my question is, where are black people going? And if every city I go to, they're being is gentrified. Where are black people going? I get this a lot. Do we have any data on where we are going mm -hmm. Twenty-four percent, mm -hmm. and I always tell everybody in this process right now, and we talk about the evaluation of and the data and the percentage of Black folks in San Francisco right now. It always depends on who you're asking, why they did the data, and who's going to profit from it all. So now you're down to that three point three or five percent African American in San Francisco, but we started, you know, back in the '60s yeah. and all that. Yeah. It was twenty-four. Yeah. So, but you know, everywhere I go. 
Mm -hmm. Where are we going? There's two processes at place. First and foremost, you had Hope Six, right? Which helped to essentially deconcentrate poverty by getting rid of public housing, right? But the problem is, especially in the city of Chicago, is that for every unit that they demolished, they only replaced like 0.10, right? So for every 30 units that were demolished, only one was replaced. So for low-income people, there's nowhere for them to go. But for surrounding suburbs, for us, that's like Naperville, Bolingbrook, Aurora, they have more Section 8 units available. So those Chicago folks who couldn't find low-income housing in the city, they take their Section 8 housing voucher to other places where Section 8 units are more available. That's suburbs, but we're also seeing a ton of Black folks going to North Dakota, Iowa, other places that have a need for labor and they have access to low-income housing. Then you've got people like me and my husband. <laughs> Who are born and raised? Well, we got to wait and see how that play out. Oh, thank you. Um, so then you got middle class and higher earning black folks who want really badly to live in the neighborhoods that they grew up in. I'm from the Chicagoland area. My husband's from East St. Louis. When we were coming back from finishing our PhDs at Michigan State, we had a kid at the time, and Zaria was going to start kindergarten. When we were trying to navigate schools in Chicago, we realized how hard it was. We also realized how hard it was to find housing in the neighborhoods that we wanted to be in that were actually kind of worth our investment, that were safe, right? That I could take her to the park, et cetera. And it's not that we didn't want to live in the city, but based off of all those other things, earning power, investments, et cetera, we ended up in Oak Park. <laughs> I say this all the time. People who are from Chicago know that Oak Park is one of the oldest uh, city suburbs, but it's also one of the more wealthier suburbs. It is super diverse. It's right off of the train line, but very easily we have access to higher value rental and homeowning. We have access to more stable schools, less crime. Don't get it twisted though. Chicago land in general is right. Um, and access to other amenities, shopping, restaurants, nightlife, et cetera, things that we can't get just three blocks over in the Austin neighborhood, which is a predominantly black neighborhood on the west side of the city of Chicago, right? So there's two things at play. We're pushing out low-income folks and we're not making space for middle-income and higher-income black folks. Um, I was curious if there's any data on interracial couples or interracial families, um, because I'm always curious about how that plays out. Well, this is a, a challenge we faced because we really wanted to see like how do interracial couples fare with mortgage lending. Um, but the problem is, and this is one of the things with data, is it just gets so like you have to just say something and write something in. So everything is just joint. So but it, it seems like joint couples are getting uh, uh, approved at much higher levels, but we don't know which joint couples. What does that mean? Uh, so the data is there's always limitations and we need better data. When it comes to housing and mortgage approvals, definitely need better data. But the one thing I would say is because the rate for joint and joint homeowners would mean two people applying for a mortgage loan of different races is much, much higher, argues that closer proximity to whiteness increases your approval rating. Um, thank you for your presentation. I really love data. Um, and what you've just shown is that it is, it is a fact, and you stated yourself that by design, Black mm -hmm. folks in Black communities are divested in, and yet it seems as though the solution to government is to program folks out of poverty. And so now that we know that that doesn't happen, and that's um, evidently impossible, mm -hmm. what do we do? What, what can government be accountable to? So in the report, we spent a lot of time talking about reparations. The Chicago Urban League also has a really big reparations report coming out in the next few months, if you want to keep your eye out for that, where they go really, really in depth. But we spent a lot of time pointing to different ways that government can actively infuse money and resources into different neighborhoods to address these issues. When it comes to income and wealth, that is a guaranteed income as... Um, Mr. Haney, yeah, he walked out, he was here, right? That's a, like an idea of guaranteed income. When it comes to housing, we need better governmental programs to help increase approval ratings for black homeowners, low-income homeowners, middle and higher income. When it comes to school, one of the big programs we talk about in our report is getting rid of SROs. SROs are security resource officers, okay? We have police in our schools in Chicago, which means then that uh, middle school fight ends up being a trip downtown 
now you have charges, you have a court date, et cetera. It vastly strengthens that uh, school to prison pipeline, okay? Same thing when we're talking about health. The city of Chicago has to be much, much better at reducing these sacrifice zones. There has to be some kind of mitigations put in place so that black folks are not suffering from the smog, from all of the factories and the highways and things of that nature that are in their area. Uh, this area of Humboldt Park, which is a large Puerto Rican community in the city of Chicago, were able to successfully file a lawsuit against um, this major factory just sitting right in the middle of Humboldt Park and it was just pumping out black smoke. And everybody in those spaces had even higher rates of asthma than other neighborhoods. Sorry, that's my um, timer because I want to keep at 45 minutes. So there are a lot of different ways that the government can participate, but we're focusing particularly on how higher education institutions can use their resources to help support nonprofit and community organizations, as was mentioned before, to develop more effective policies and programs and things of that nature. Yeah, or, sorry, we got a couple questions. We got an online question. Okay, that's fine. Well, I just wanted to address the, uh, what you were saying about programs. Well, one of the things we're seeing is this rise of uh, investor cash-based purchasing. And these, these banks are just uh, coming in, swooping in, and buying homes. So I think there has to be some kind of solution uh, where that we really rein these banks in and just make it easier for working people to you know, achieve their dreams. And it's the opposite now. Everything is being taken away from people. So I just think this, yeah, universities, I mean, the way that universities are being this model for, uh, oh, we're going to develop cities with universities. Well, that, that's how you get to San Francisco uh, with basically no working class. That is not the model. We can't have that model. Uh, we need a model that works for the people. And universities are really good at gentrifying. Right. I say this at Loyola and I, I look around, make sure nobody's in the classroom. Um, Loyola University all by itself has brought up some 45 to 60 percent of the residential space around campus in the last 10 years. OK, which means that housing supply in Rogers Park has like dropped and Rogers Park is the overwhelmingly black and Middle Eastern community. And so rental rates have skyrocketed. All right, this question is uh, from online and thank you to everybody. We have a lot of folks watching online. So, um, so first it says, thank you for this panel. This is such powerful information for our time. How do we utilize it and expand the advancement of black people in other sectors and industries? In my syllabus for class. I always put in there that the reason why I'm here to share this information with you is so that you're an engaged citizen. Of course, they want to pass their exams, get their credit, and graduate. But my hope is that they're listening, they're reading this information, they're processing it, and they're articulating their own opinions, all right? Because there's a ton of people out here voting, and they don't understand the processes. And that includes people in our communities as well, right? In Chicago, I often see people rooting for politicians or policies that are not exactly in their best interest. I think one of the best things that we can do as scholars is to continue to do work that matters, but making sure that that information gets to the community members and in a manner that they can understand and vibe with so that they can use that when they're out voting. All right, they say we have to wrap it up, but we'll take this last question real quick. I know your focus is um, academics and university. I'm just interested in the resources that help us to identify the antidotes to those sacrifice zones, because we definitely have them in San Francisco, and it's definitely um, an issue in the predominantly Black neighborhoods. It's really hard because these corporations have so much money. Right. And in the city of Chicago, they spend a lot in permits. And a lot of people don't know this. I don't know how it works out here. Oftentimes, Property developers and even some of these corporations get away with their um, business that has a negative effect on black spaces by simply paying a fee. So many of those companies that exist in sacrifice zones, the city knows they're polluting the air, they're polluting the water, whatever, but as long as they come off a little bit of money, then they allow them to stay. For, for Humboldt Park, it took a lot of effort. It was a huge coalition and leaders that got behind them to help get rid of that factory. And one question they want to know, is this PowerPoint accessible? Can can they get access to your PowerPoint? Or? Um, yes, I will send it to somebody. <laughs> yes, no problem. Um, and the, the um, State of Black City report should be available by the end of the year as well. Mm -hmm.